am going to continue my discussion of chapter 14 of Richard Bauckham's book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. I left off talking about Richard Bauckham's proposed evidence that he finds uh, in the final two verses of the Gospel of John um, that he uses to, uh, to bolster his argument that the Gospel of John is based on eyewitness testimony. And Richard Bauckham is pretty much putting all of his eggs in that basket. That is his primary, if not his sole, piece of evidence that he has used thus far. Uh, that the Gospel of John is based on eyewitness testimony. That is the final two verses where this character named the Beloved Disciple declares himself to be um, the authoritative testimony of those uh, things that have been written. So I talked, to, I talked last time about the scholarly consensus of the Gospel of John being that the final chapter uh, was added by a later uh, editor and was probably written by a different author than the rest of the gospel. Now, with that said, Richard bauckham has got a huge problem. If that is the scholarly consensus regarding the gospel of John, and if his testimony is within that contested chapter, well, you know, Richard Bauckham has to uh, spend the bulk of chapter 14 of his book arguing for the integrity of the Gospel of John, that is, the Gospel of John as we have it, is as it was originally written. And by golly, that, uh, that uh, evidence that he has of eyewitness testimony, it's in there. Uh, don't listen to the scholarly consensus. <laughs> so in this discussion, I want to continue uh, talking about what Richard Bauckham sees uh, in the Gospel of John and how he's going to argue about the ending of the Gospel of John. As I discussed last time, um, the scholarly consensus sees the second to last chapter of the Gospel of John, or the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, as the true conclusion, uh, with chapter 21 added later. No, no, Richard Bauckham says, this is his idea. What he's going to argue for is not a conclusion that ends at chapter 20, despite all appearances. Rather, the Gospel of John has a conclusion in two stages. The two stages being the first stage, the final two verses of chapter 20. The second stage being the final two verses of chapter 21. And they're separated by a narrative epilogue. I went over all of that in the previous discussion. So, with that said, let's look at these two stages of the conclusion of the Gospel of John. The, the final two verses of chapter 20, that is the first stage, uh, begin like this. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, etc. Um, the second stage, John chapter 21, begins like this. This is the disciple who testifies of these things, uh, etc. So Richard Bauckham is going to draw a or spend a lot of time drawing a distinction between uh, the first stage, which uses the word signs, or in Greek, semion, and the second stage, which uses the word things, or in Greek, tauton. Uh, Richard Bauckham says that this is not only a natural progression, uh, that is, uh, the specificity of the word signs to uh, more general things, uh, you know, tauton, things, but that this is done by design, by the author of the Gospel of John. Here's what Richard Bauckham says on page 366. The first stage of the conclusion accurately and appropriately indicates the end of the gospel's narrative specifically of signs, and with it the completion of the gospel's main aim of enabling Christological faith, while the second stage equally accurately and appropriately marks the end of the whole gospel. So this is Richard Bauckham's 
strategy for arguing that there, the conclusion of the Gospel of John is actually in two stages. The first stage marks off the end of signs, semion. The second stage is more general and marks off the whole end of the, in the entire Gospel. Now, Richard Bauckham, in reading this chapter 14, does not ex really expand on this theme of signs versus things very much. But in reading it, and with my background in, in uh, uh, Bible reading churches or churches that had a lot of Bible study in them, like Calvary Chapel, it brought to mind a lot of Bible studies that I went through uh, many, many decades ago now, many years ago, um, in which they said that the Gospel of John is based on a series of seven uh, items. For instance, the Gospel of John is based on seven I am statements. Uh, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the living water, you know, whatever. He said this seven times in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is based on seven uh, major discourses. The Gospel of John is based on uh, seven key references to the uh, book of Isaiah, things like that. One of the other things that was often said, and I'm thinking specifically of my favorite Bible teacher, uh, Chuck Missler, <laughs> who uh, I've got a tape, a cassette tape from decades ago. Uh, I used to memorize these things, believe it or not. But uh, I, I still hear in my mind Chuck Missler saying that the Gospel of John is based on seven miracles. Um, so what he, I think, meant by that was semion, signs. The Gospel of John is based on seven signs. And so reading Richard Bauckham brought these things to mind, these old Bible studies that I used to attend, where they talked about the seven signs or the seven miracles of the Gospel of John. Richard Bauckham does not come out strictly and specifically stating that the Gospel of John is based on seven signs or seven miracles. He doesn't say this. But he is trying to draw a distinction between signs, semion, and things, that is, more general items that Jesus did, with the implication, at least, being that the, the evangelist, John, uh, is making a, a, making a distinction between uh, miracles, let's say, and a special class of miracles, or a special class of items that Jesus did that are marked off, called signs semion in Greek. That is, miracles that are specifically done to draw people to Christological faith, to draw people to faith in Jesus. Not just a garden variety miracle or not just a garden variety you know, thing that Jesus did. Something done specifically with that intent in mind. Um, so, I decided to go back and look at different sources. I didn't spend too much time doing this, but I looked at different sources uh, regarding these signs in the Gospel of John, and it spans the spectrum of, of, of theological belief. Uh, Rudolf Bultmann, in my commentary on the Gospel of John, uh, Richard Bauckham's arch, arch enemy, <laughs> uh, talks about um, how the, the, the Gospel of John draws from a hypothetical source called that he calls the Book of Signs. And he talks about that. I don't think he says that there are specifically seven of them, however. Um, but he does say that there are such things in the Gospel of John as signs, semion in Greek. Um, so you've got that end of the spectrum and even up to my, my Thompson Chain Reference Study Bible, uh, the most fundamentalist Bible uh, around. Um, even that, in its commentary on the Gospel of John, talks about the signs of the Gospel of John. However, it doesn't use seven. It uses eight for some strange reason. Um, 
Be that it is made, let's look at some other sources, for instance. Um, here's something from the Bible Knowledge Commentary by Walvoord and Zuck. They talk about the seven signs in the Gospel of John. Um, and it itemizes them. Uh, the changing of water of wine into Cana, uh, the healing of the official son, healing at the pool of Bethesda, feeding of 5,000, walking on water, healing a blind man, uh, and raising Lazarus from the dead. By the way, most of these are pretty much uncontested no matter what source you are looking at. There are a few that are contested. For instance, if I go to another source, uh, this one from Kostenberger of uh, Kostenberger and Kruger, the heresy of orthodoxy fame <laughs> in his book, <laughs> The Cradle, the Cross, and the Crown. Uh, in this book on page 312, uh, Kostenberger also uh, lists the seven signs of the Gospel of John, and he lists pretty much the same ones except for a slight difference. Whereas Walvoord and Zuck have the walking on the water uh, near the Sea of Galilee, Koster and Pr Kruger does not have that, but he includes the clearing of the temple. So there's not, you know, there there's not a hard and fast list of things specifically mentioned as signs. Um, I think my Th Thompson Chain Reference Bible. Uh, lists the resurrection as the eighth sign. So again, there's not a hard and fast rule here, but there still, nonetheless, is a tradition regarding the signs. Even my, my New American Bible, my Catholic New American Bible, talks about the seven signs in the Gospel of John. The climactic sign being, of course, the uh, resurrection of Lazarus. So the point being that Catholic fundamentalist, uh, Rudolf Bultmann, so source cri or, uh, form criticism, um, whatever the source, it, it appears that there is a scholarly, a Christian tradition uh, across many, many uh, be belief spectrums regarding the signs in the Gospel of John. I don't know where Richard Bauckham falls in this. He never really talks about it, but he is however, relying on the reader of his book having some background knowledge uh, regarding the signs. Uh, you know, his back, his, he is assuming that his audience are, are fundamentalist Christians. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Um, but so, so Richard Bauckham doesn't really have to expand on what he means by signs. I'm guessing he thinks that the reader knows exactly what he's talking about. So that's why it's bringing these things to mind. Let's look, um, with that said, let's take a little sidetrack and look at some of these signs that are in the Gospel of John. Because remember, the whole point behind Richard Bauck and bringing this up is that the first stage of the conclusion of the Gospel of John is referencing semion, signs, and that brings that section to a close, and it's done intentionally by the author of the Gospel of John. And the second stage is just wrapping it all up with things, just general garden variety miracles that are not necessarily intended to do what signs are supposed to do. These are two separate categories that Richard Bauckham is specifically marking off in his argument that the Gospel of John is based on eyewitness testimony and is written by a single author. So I have to keep that in mind. With that in mind, let's go through some of these examples of signs and things. First place I want to start off with is the first stage of the conclusion, as Richard Bauckham calls it. John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So, in that first stage of the conclusion, as Richard Bauckham calls it, 
you have Jesus did many other signs, followed by what you could call a definition of what a sign is. This is written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing you may have life in his name. In other words, this sign is written specifically for Christological faith. That's kind of the sign. However, okay, let's look at this. Just look at the grammar of this first stage. In all of the sources that I have looked at, the final climactic apex sign in the Gospel of John is the raising of Lazarus. The raising of Lazarus is often considered to be the seventh and final sign. It is considered that by Kostenberger. It is considered that by Walvoord. It is considered that by my Catholic uh, New American Bible. However, that was way back in chapter 11 of the Gospel of John. Now, in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, where we have the first stage of the conclusion, the author is saying that Jesus did many other signs. Huh? Is he referring to something way back nine chapters earlier? The grammar, just looking at the grammar, says that no, he's talking about something that happened immediately preceding John chapter 20, verse 30. What was that? What immediately preceded this? The story of doubting Thomas is what immediately precedes this. So my question is, just based on the grammar, is the story of, is the miracle of the, res, of, of the appearance of Jesus before doubting Thomas and Thomas's coming to belief based on his appearance, based on the wounds in his side, is that considered a sign? And, and if that brings Thomas to Christological faith and it is not a sign, I, my question is, why not? Why is the grammar indicates it? The fact that Thomas came to faith indicates it. Why is this not considered a sign other than the tradition that there are seven signs? See, that's what this tradition has done, in my uh, opinion. That's kind of interesting to me. Um, now, let's look at the second stage of the conclusion. The second stage, let me find it here. Okay, the second stage of the conclusion, or the conclusion of the Gospel of John, is this is the disciple who testifies of these things, tout tone, and wrote these things, etc., etc. So what immediately precedes this? What does he mean by these things? What immediately precedes this? Well, you could say that it is the story of the miraculous catch of fish. Is this a sign? Well, Richard Bauckham says this is not a sign. This is a thing. Richard Bauckham says on page 363, Jesus did many things that were not signs. For example, the miracle in chapter 21 is not a sign. Uh, that is the miracle of the catching of fish. Since it does not serve to reveal Jesus' glory and thus to enable belief in him, as the signs do, but rather to symbolize the coming mission of the church. That's Richard Bauckham from page 363. Yeah, I got no doubt. It's the catching of fish symbolizes the, uh, the uh, it's a symbol of, of new converts. It's the symbol of a growing church. No doubt about that. However, <laughs> however, Richard Bauckham, again, is trying to draw that distinction between signs and things. Signs being that it brings Christological faith to people. Things being something more general. Um, does it do that? Well, let's look at the miraculous catch of fish. In chapter 21, verse 4, Jesus speaks to the disciples, but they don't recognize him. They're just fishing. In verse 6, Jesus commands the disciples to an action. Throw the net to the other side. And what happens? This action induces a miracle. Immediately after Jesus is recognized as the Lord, Simon Peter freaks out and jumps into the lake naked to greet him. And then in verse 12, finally, all the disciples recognize Jesus as the Lord. Uh, to me, I mean, you could argue that the miraculous catch of fish 
does all the functions of what is otherwise called a sign, a semi-own, because of this miracle of the catching of fifth fish, the the disciples who were otherwise just out fishing, uh, are have a renewed faith. They recognize Jesus as the Lord. That's the function of a sign. So, Richard Bauckham, and I understand that this is going against all you know uh, traditions regarding what a sign is. However, just looking at it. It appears to me that Richard Baucom is not making a clear distinction between signs on the one hand and things at the other. With that said, let's look at some of the, in fact, let's look at all of the signs, um, just briefly, uh, that are in this tradition, this Bible study tradition. The, the, let's look at the uncontested signs, that is, signs that are agreed upon by my New American Bible, by my Thompson Chain reference, by um, Kostenberger, by Wall of Word, by all of these guys. Let's look at some of these quote-unquote signs, semi-own, that are uncontested. They all agree with these things. And let's look at why they are considered signs or why they could be considered signs. First off, we have the changing of water into wine. This is uncontested. Everybody appears to agree that this is the first sign performed by Jesus because of John chapter 2, verse 11. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. There you go. Sign number one, changing water into wine. Uh, the next uncontested sign is um, in chapter 4, and that is the healing of the official son. Why is this considered a sign? Well, again, because uh, the, the, uh, the narrator just comes right out and says it, and he not only says it, he itemizes it. In chapter 4, verse 54, after the miracle of the healing of, uh, of the official son, it says, this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Oh, very cool. So there you go. The signs are being itemized now. This is the second one, the second sign. This one is uncontested again, um, amongst all commentators that I have seen because, it, uh, because of this itemization, because it is numbered. This is the second one. And there are other verses where Jesus says, um, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. He says this in verse 48. Uh, so this is explicitly a sign performed by Jesus. Now, something kind of interesting, however. There are some commentators that go back to the, I think it's the previous chapter, where what happens? It's the cleansing of the temple. And some commentators use the cleansing of the temple as a sign. Now, if the turning of water into wine in Cana in chapter 2 is the first sign, and the healing of the official son in chapter 4 is the second sign, then how can some people say that the cleansing of the temple, which happens in between these two signs, how can that be considered a sign? Isn't that a contradiction? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's see what happens here. Uh, this is a contested sign, the cleansing of the temple, uh, John chapter 2. Uh, uh, verse 18 refers explicitly to Jesus' cleansing of the temples. When the Jews ask Jesus, what sign do you show to us since you do these, scene, do these things? What sign, semi-own, in the context, this is referring explicitly to the cleansing of the temple. Uh, in verse 23, uh, when, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. And this is a little more ambiguous, but in the context, there's, it, it looks like it is also referring to the cleansing of the temple. 
So some commentators refer to the cleansing of the temple as a sign. But doesn't this make a contradiction, uh, you know, between, on the one hand, the first sign being explicitly called the, um, the turning of water into wine at Cana, and the second sign being the healing of the official son in chapter 4, said explicitly. Well, check this out. I thought this was interesting. In the, uh, for instance, most translators will say that verse, chapter 4, verse 54 is that this is the second sign that Jesus did. To get around this contradiction, listen to what the NIV, the New International Version, says. This was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed. Oh, I see. So the NIV then, in order to get out of this contradiction, is making a distinction between a sign and a miraculous sign. That is, the uh, cleansing of the temple, if it is a sign, isn't exactly a miracle. It's just Jesus bundling a cord of a uh, bundle of whips and cords together and beating some people up. So uh, that's how the NIV gets around a contradiction. I swear, I am so tempted one of these days. I find the NIV, is a, they're, they're masters at this. Uh, the translators are masters at, at translating the New Testament to remove contradictions like this. And, and I swear, I want to start a series of just showing how the NIV does this. I see it all over the place. So I thought that was kind of interesting that, uh, you know, there, in order to get, get around this distinction between signs and miracles and things and, you know, they, they make this distinction between miracles and signs even. Kind of weird. Anyhow, let's continue. Uh, the next uncontested sign is the healing of the uh, lame man at the pool of Bethesda, which is uncontested, but I don't understand why, because I can find no reference in the Gospel of John to its being called specifically a sign, semi-own. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, verse, uh, in, in chapter 5, verse 16, this event is called a thing, tauton, uh, referring explicitly to this miracle. Uh, it says, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. These things, tauton. Hey, isn't that the more general garden run-of-the-mill thing? So why is it included in the list of signs? Semi-own. In my opinion, it's done to continue with this tradition of seven, the, the list of seven in the Gospel of John. It's, it's a tradition amongst um, uh, Bible, Bible studies. That's the best I can call it. Now, please remember in all of this that Richard Baucom is drawing a distinction between signs and things, semion and tauton, and the implication being that things are just generic run-of-the-mill garden variety events that happen that don't uh, fit the category of signs. Signs being specific events, specific miracles that bring faith in Jesus. That's that's the tradition anyway. Um, however, let's, let's look at, now we, we looked at something now that was that I think is, is, is called a sign, yet is not included in many of these traditional lists. Let's look at something that is called a thing. And I'm looking at specifically the calling of the disciple Nathaniel way back in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, John chapter 1, verses 47 through 50. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. 
Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, this is significant because this is a miracle performed by Jesus. This is the miracle of clairvoyance. Jesus sees Nathanael from afar off and and. Nathanael recognizes this miracle of clairvoyance. And what is the result of this miracle? <laughs> Nathanael declares him to be the Son of God and the King of Israel. It brings Christological faith. That is the whole intent of a sign, semion. Is this called a sign by, uh, in this story? No, it is not. It is called explicitly a thing, <laughs> a tauton. You will see greater things than these. That is the, from the words of Jesus. Tauton. Jesus calls this tauton, not semion. So this is an event, a miracle, which fits all the categories, which fits all the criterion of a sign, a semion. Yet, Jesus himself calls it tauton. So, you know, again, think of this in the context of Richard Baucom trying to draw a distinction between signs and things. Okay, let's leave that aside. The next uncontested sign is the feeding of the multitude. Uh, this is uncontested. All commentators that I have found includes this as a sign. This is from John chapter 6. Um, Jesus performed the sign of the multiplication of loaves and fishes. And I do think that this actually is pretty explicit. That Jesus performs this miracle with the intent of bringing faith to him. Um, but people, Jesus recognizes that people don't, recognize the sign but they're not following him because of that sign they're following jesus because they want full bellies i think that's pretty explicit and i think that's one of the strongest uh, miracles in the gospel of john if you want to make that case that there are specific events called signs that are intended to draw faith in jesus okay one more uncontested sign and that is the healing of the blind man. So when Jesus heals the blind man in John chapter 9, uh, this is called a sign, uh, by, but it, it's not called a sign by the uh, narrator. It's not called a sign by Jesus. Who calls this a sign? Uh, the peanut gallery, basically. It's just bystanders. Uh, they say, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. That's what the Pharisees say. And then others, you know, bystanders, they say, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? Uh, so because of that verse, how can uh, this man be a sinner when he does these signs? Uh, that's why this is an uncontested uh, sign amongst commentators. It's explicitly called that. However, it's called that by, you know, the peanut gallery. <laughs> and I, I, I think this is important because it's demonstrating by showing that there are the distinction between signs on the one hand and things on the other hand, semi-own versus tauton, is not as cut and dry as Boakum is making it. He's making an argument that these are distinct items, you know, and, and I'm not finding it. Uh, when you look at them one by one, I don't see it. So I'm not sure that Bauckham's argument is uh, valid. Let's look at the, um, the climactic sign, the seventh sign in chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus. Why is this called a sign? Well, in chapter 11, verse 47, just after the resurrection, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and they said, what shall we do for this man, meaning Jesus, works many signs? 
which I think is interesting. The Pharisees, the enemies of Jesus, are recognizing these miracles as explicit signs uh, or explicit miracles designed to draw Christological faith. Um, and for that reason, they sought to kill him. This is the point where the Pharisees sought to kill Jesus. It wasn't at his triumphal entry. Uh, it was, um, it was uh, at the raising of Lazarus at least six days before. Um, the next contested sign, there is one more contested sign that is not all commentators uh, agree on this, and that is Jesus walking on the water. And this occurs immediately after the feeding of the multitude. Very strange story, and I can't refer to it, oh, I can't find a reference to it as being called anything. That's why I've got a big question mark here. I, it's not called a sign. It's not called a thing. It's just something that Jesus did. He was out walking on the water. Very strange story. However, this is included in the list of signs by some commentators. Kind of interesting. So, there are, if you do a search, let's say on Bible Hub or look in your concordance, whatever, just look up semion, the Greek word semion. There are lots of references to signs in the Gospel of John. And by the way, there's lots of references to signs in all four Gospels. Semion is used frequently. I mean, every time you see the word miracle in your English Bible, um, it's pretty much semion. It's a sign. It's a, it's a, it's a miracle. It's... So it's not exclusive, it's not unique to the Gospel of John. There are many other instances of, of, of signs in the four Gospels. Why, it's, why this, 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 uh, this, this narrowing of seven signs, I do call it a tradition. I think that's all it is. It's just something that has gained momentum within Bible studies. Hey, the Gospel of John is based on seven signs. Not everybody can agree on what they are, and there are lots of instances of signs that are not included in that, I'll call it, canonical list of seven. I'm going to give my favorite example, however, of a sign uh, in the Gospel of John that is not included in any of the lists. As a matter of fact, this is something that happens in the Gospel of John that... I rarely hear in the list of any miracles done by Jesus. It's in John chapter 12, verses 27 through 30. Jesus is in the temple uh, grounds, and he's talking to a bunch of unbelieving Jews. Here's what he says. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. I love that episode. I would love to see <laughs> this crazy miracle properly dramatized. I, I've only seen one Jesus movie with this scene in it. Uh, that, scene, that, that movie being the Gospel of John, which has every word in the Gospel of John included. And it did a rotten job of it. Um, this is a scene where Jesus is saying, What do you want me to do? Do you want me to say to my father, save me? I'm not going to do that. This is why I came. Jesus looks up to the sky, I imagine at least. Jesus looks up to the sky and says, Father, glorify your name. He's speaking explicitly to the Father. In answer, the Father thunders from the sky, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. <laughs> and the people said, it thundered. Some people said it must have been an angel. And then Jesus goes on to explain, Hey, that wasn't for my sake, you jackasses. That voice came for your sake. <laughs> I love that miracle, I tell you. Um, so is this a sign? <laughs> the sign of the voice from heaven. 
Well, in verse 37 of, the chap of, of chapter 12, yes, it is called a sign. But although he had done so many signs before them, that is the Jews, they did not believe in him. Signs, semion. This crazy event happens before the very same crowd. And it's done for the sake of the crowd. It's done to bring them to an understanding of what his mission is. It's done with an understanding that it is to bring them to Christological faith. Didn't work. It backfired. Nonetheless, it is called a sign in verse 37. Semion. So uh, that's pretty crazy stuff. That is my favorite miracle. The, uh, the most undermentioned miracle in the Gospel of John. <laughs> I love it. Well, that's the end of my discussion. Those are just some kind of interesting things that I found. And I, I think Richard Blockham's claim that there is a distinction between signs and things is one based on a long-standing tradition in Bible studies that I think may have some merit in that there are signs being performed by Jesus. Signs meant to draw people to Christological faith. Yeah, I buy that. A canonical list of seven, a traditional list of seven explicitly that the Gospel of John is based on? I don't think so. And I don't see any reason to think that there is a distinction being made between signs on the one hand and things on the other uh, as evidence that the Gospel of John uh, is, is written by one author. I don't see that either. I, I, I think that's based on this tradition of, of, of signs in the Gospel of John. Okay, I'm going to leave you with one more parting thought, and this is kind of my segue into the next discussion. I'm going to continue talking about chapter 14 of Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, and I'm going to give you one more example of a sign, and that's the famous scene where a, uh, a, uh, a uh, teacher of the synagogue comes to Jesus by night in chapter 3 and says, Rabbi, we know that you are the uh, the teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him semi own signs same word what signs is being referred to here don't know the nearest I can tell is the cleansing of the temple just given the context I don't know however so again you know on, on the one hand there are lots of, of references to signs in general in the Gospel of John that don't refer to anything specific. On the other hand, and this is my segue into the next discussion, starting with verse 16 and continuing through verse 21 of chapter 3, Jesus answers this, this teacher um, in, in very esoteric terms. And he switches into the third person. Read it for yourself. I'll, I'll talk more about this next time. But Jesus switches into the third person. Think about the most famous verse in the Bible. Uh, John 3.16 uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in me, etc. Why doesn't Jesus say for whosoever should believe in me will not perish but have everlasting. Why does, why does he switch to the third person? So I'll leave you with that thought. I'll talk about that more in the next discussion. Until that time, uh, you guys take care. Not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. <laughs> 